brought to you from Melbourne, Australia. This is the Badminton Podcast, a community for badminton players by badminton players, where we talk badminton, celebrate local heroes, interview players from all walks of life, and push you to grow as a player and a person. Introducing your hosts, Jeff and Henry. Hello, everyone out there in the badminton community. Whether you're a long-time listener or this is the first time you've listened to the podcast, we just want to say welcome and thank you for tuning in to the Badminton Podcast, proudly brought to you by Volantware. My name is Jeff. And I'm Henry. We're the co-founders of Volantware and the co-hosts of this podcast. And we're really here to bring the love of badminton to everyone that we know all around the world. What our brands aim to do is basically bring the unsightly clothing that badminton players usually wear take that away and put in their hands some really nice versatile cool simple badminton apparel that makes you feel good on and off the court so make sure you do check us out www.volantwear.com there are heaps of free resources there as well that can help you with your game and in your life you can also follow us on our social media our handle is at volantwear v-o-l-a-n-t-w-e-a-r now we're really excited to be here to share with you another episode about how much we love badminton and bring you something where you can hear some stories, some experiences, and some love of the sport from different people around the world. And that's what we're doing right here, right now, today for you right now. So thanks a lot for tuning into this episode. Now, before we come on and introduce our awesome guests, we just want to say thank you for all the people who have supported us so far on our Patreon account. So basically, Henry and I, we love hosting the Badminton Podcast, but it is a completely self-funded project. So we'd really love your help. In order for us to release high quality episodes and regular episodes that everyone enjoys, we've set up this Patreon account where you can pledge just a few dollars per month that really does help us a lot. We really appreciate all the people who have supported us so far and we've given them shout outs on some episodes. So if you want your own shout out and you want to be part of everything here, we'd love to have you on board. Just visit patreon.com slash the badminton podcast and the link will be in the description below. So today we're bringing on our first trio onto the Badminton Podcast, one of whom is a very familiar face, and we'll introduce him first. His name is Rajiv Rai, aka Raju Rai, back in his playing days. He's a former Olympian and the number 37 men's singles player in the world. He also featured on episode 37 of the podcast, where we talked about many things, including the exciting first ever foundation where he's the founder and the CEO. So before we introduce our additional two guests, we'd just love to have a recap with Raj as to what the first ever foundation is and what opportunity it gives young players like our guests today. So without further ado, Raj, really nice to have you on the episode once again. Yeah, appreciate you guys bringing me on again. Just to give a little background on the first ever foundation, what we created was to solve an issue that we've been facing in, uh, I would say, in a few different generations of uh, batches of players in United States badminton. And that issue is when they graduate high school, what do they do post high school as they're um, going into their college career? Do they continue to play badminton and sacrifice their education or do they choose the other route and uh, basically retire as a badminton player? So we came up with this foundation and this uh, badminton scholarship where We'll give, for example, William and Esther an opportunity to go to school, get their education, and give them some partially funded scholarship so that they can pursue, you know, becoming a professional badminton player or getting themselves out there to get some international experience or entertaining other training ideas, whether it's a a private lesson with a top-level coach or a personal trainer to, to further develop themselves in their career at the next level. So that's pretty much what we're focused on as a foundation right now and very honored to be joining you guys today to share a little more about uh, our story. Yeah, we're really excited to have you back on, Raj. And yeah, talking about the First Ever Foundation, I want to move on to our two young adults who are joining us on this podcast as well. And I'll give a brief introduction for both of them. Firstly, starting with the young lady we have on here, Esther She, I believe that's how you pronounce your surname, Esther. So it wasn't until Esther was 13 that she found the sport she'd fallen in love with for a lifetime. For her, badminton is so much more than just a hobby. 
It's a passion and a dream. Throughout the nearly six years she's been training competitively in the sport, she's not only seen herself grow physically and mentally, but emotionally and spiritually as well. Pursuing badminton in an area of the country where there are limited resources, the motivation to overcome these obstacles and achieve her dream has shaped her into the person she is today. Welcome onto the podcast, Esther. Thank you. And now we'll move on to William before we continue our chat. So William, William started playing badminton with his family when he was seven years old. He would play with his parents and his family and friends. He loves badminton because of how complex and fun it is. He plays it at Bellevue Badminton Club. For the listeners who don't know where that is, that's in Washington in the US. I had to Google that, so it's okay if you don't know where that is. So around five to six times a week is how much he plays. His his biggest achievement was representing the USA at the World Juniors in Kazan last year. And the sport has taught him how to approach life. He's learned how to take calculated risks, deal with stress and balance a heavy workload and carve his own path to success. I love that. So welcome onto the podcast, William. Thank you so much. So before we get onto the juicy stuff, Jeff and I would both like to congratulate you on becoming the first ever, first ever foundation recipients. Thank you so much. Thank you. And just another segue before we get into the main topics, um, I spent a little time on Reddit um, in the last few months or so spruiking our podcast and I ran into a fan of yours, Esther. So this is, I guess, a moment for me to read out what they've said. So I don't think you'd know this is coming, Esther. So um, (laughs) so basically, they're, they're two players who've been asking you for footwork and general tips as well as practice games after your training sessions during summer. They said, tell her not to be nervous for the interview and be as calm as you are normally during your matches. I don't actually know their names, but yeah, so... This is your moment to to say a hello to them or whatever you like would like to say your, to your fans. Oh, I was not expecting this, but I'm really honored that some people that I guess I played with thought about me because I didn't mention it to some people, I guess, when I was training. So thank you for supporting me to all those that would like post something on Reddit um, about this podcast. And I'll try not to be nervous, but I'm already a little bit nervous, to be honest. (laughs) But yeah, thank you to everyone. Awesome. It's always a bit tricky when you get put on the spot like that. So good work, Henry, for bringing that up. We weren't prepared for that whatsoever. (laughs) So no, that's fantastic. Hope the people listening out there who do know Esther and William, they really do have a good listen as to what their story has been so far. And that's what we want to get into right now. So William, we'll start off with you. We'd love to know, you look at 18 years old, you've just received the first of a foundation scholarship the scholarship recipient there, and you've already represented Australia, uh, Australia. you've already represented the US at the World Juniors. Now, how did you get started? What's your badminton story been so far? I'd love just to hear about what you've been through. And you've said that you've overcome some obstacles and you've really helped to take calculated risks, deal with stress, et cetera. It sounds like a very, very mature kind of answer for just an 18-year-old. What has badminton brought you? Uh, yeah, so like Henry said before, I started playing with my parents and our family friends. And when I was younger, it was all about just like having fun and just playing as many games as I could because I just found it really fun just jumping around all the time. And as I grew older, I started playing more tournaments and especially in Bellevue, at least, the training isn't super serious. It's just like we play to get better, but it's not like we're training to compete at a very high level. So over time, as I went to more out-of-state tournaments in the U.S., I realized that everyone from our club was at a pretty big disadvantage compared to like the hotspot of U.S. badminton, which would be California. And so I would just always take extra time doing training to always try and get as much as I could out of training. And as I continued competing, I just started getting better and better results. And because of that, I would just like, I found the beauty in the sport over time, not really at the beginning, because I think when I was younger, it was just a fun hobby that I played with my friends. Yeah, great. And I guess moving on to you, Esther, and about your badminton story as well. 
is it similar to William where you sort of developed a love for the sport or was there a single moment where you just decided, yep, this is the sport for me? Uh, For me, it's actually very different from William's story. It might be closer to what you mentioned in the letter that maybe there wasn't like a single defining moment, but I feel like since I did discover the sport pretty late compared to most like competitive athletes, when I did end up starting to play and train more, I just like really fell in love with the sport um, over a short period of time. So just for both of you, when was it that you decided that you wanted to take things very seriously? Because of course, everyone goes to that phase of just starting and just playing for fun because that's what badminton is about. But then when did that competitive spirit and that desire to do great things come into it? Was it very young or did it come a bit later? So for me, it was actually during my first junior nationals. And at the time I was 12, I think, and I was playing U13. And that was my first like really big uh, national tournament. So I was really nervous. But because of that, I just like lost first round. All my events just like went home after the first day. And I was like, I can't just only play one day. And after that, I just like did as much as I could to just try and get to the top. And how far away from you at the top at that time? Was it something that you were were quite close or were you quite far? If you look back at it, did you have to work really hard to get to where you are now? Or were you already kind of at the top to start off with? Uh, When I first competed in that nationals, I was, I don't want to say I was a nobody, but I was just like the first round person who just goes and plays for fun. So I was actually pretty far away from the top. Mm Mm-hmm. I know, I know that feeling, William. I remember when I, um, this resonates with me because when I first started playing badminton, I was, I think I was like about 15 or 16 and I played my first under 17s nationals tournament and our team came 13th out of 16th and I lost the first round in every single event. So I know exactly, I know that feeling, but it, yeah, it sort of lit up a fire in me afterwards as well. So how about yourself, Esther? Can you give us a bit of a rundown? Uh Well, similar to William, I think I also kind of started thinking about bouncing more seriously after my first nationals, which was only a few months after I started training seriously. So I was very, very far from what I considered to be like my goal in the future. But even worse than I played the qualification match and lost in qualification finals. So I didn't even get into the main draw. So yeah, I pretty much was there for one day and then just vacationed. But after that, like seeing those players that even like won their first round, like for me, it was still very far off. And it definitely really motivated me to feel like I wanted to improve. Yep. So in terms of your motivation now, where does your motivation mainly come from? So Esther, does it come more from the, do you love to train or do you love to compete? Do you love to see your teammates? Do you love, what do you love about badminton that keeps you training hard and working and striving for more today? Well, that is a very loaded question because I feel like there are an endless number of reasons why I love badminton, but a big part of it definitely incorporates the training and competing Like I love both aspects very much. I think a big part about training specifically is I really enjoy to push myself physically and mentally. I enjoy like challenging myself and um, improving, whether it be in skills or even like mentally. I really enjoy like that portion of training. Okay. And William? Yeah, I would say I'm pretty similar to Esther, but... For me, it's also just like, I'm a really active person. I can't really sit still at my desk very long. And I just love just like running and jumping around the court. But besides that, I feel like about badminton is that I'm always learning new things and it's always teaching me those new things. And because of that, I'm like constantly learning every training practice that I have. Yeah. And you talked about your learnings and and the ability to learn to take calculated risks in your life as well outside of badminton, William. Are there anything anything in particular that badminton has taught you specifically? Uh, I think just being able to go 100% for what you want to do rather than trying to spread out all your time into different things, even if you're not as passionate in it as much. 
Sure. And when you talk about the passion and the love, there must be a point in time where you probably remember that there was just an awesome moment in your career so far that you just reflect on and it kind of give you goosebumps and you just really smile to yourself about it. So if you're thinking about either your biggest badminton achievement or the fondest memory you've had so far in your badminton career, what would you say that would be? And you can name names, you can call out your teammates if there's anyone in particular that you want to say, hey, it was a really good time or a really good victory with this person. But was there a certain one that you keep remembering over and over? Yeah, I think my JIT, which is the Junior International Trials in the US last year, because that tournament was, I had actually won that tournament and I made the Pan Am team. And since that was something I've been working for like two years, and I was just like, after that moment, I just couldn't handle any of my emotions. Yeah, awesome. And Esther? I think probably my biggest achievement was winning adult nationals because I definitely went to that tournament not really expecting to win, also since it was my first adult nationals. And I think the finals game was very intense and I was just very grateful that I was able to like apply everything I've learned in training thus far. And in the end, like it was, it felt like all the hard work was finally worth it. Awesome. So yes, to take us back to that final moment in that finals, what were you feeling? Do you remember it? Well, to be honest, the most intense set of that match was the second game since I lost the first one. And the second was like, I was trailing actually almost the entire set until the end and I kind of like clutched it out. And the third game, I kind of got my momentum back. So it was a more comfortable game, but I still had to focus very hard. But I think that match like really taught me um, how to be patient and to stay focused even when there's a lot of pressure. And I think when the match was over, I just felt very, very relieved. And the moment was almost a little bit surreal to me as well since I just like wasn't thinking about winning. And when I realized like I won adult nationals, it was a pretty exciting moment. I definitely sounds it. And I'd say just from a, a veteran like myself to two young up and coming players, it's these moments that you can really bring to the forefront of your memory when you lack motivation, if you're not feeling good, because you can always bring these feelings and these memories back. I remember just specifically, there was just one, it was a national competition as well for me. It was the very first round and we just had the team event the day before and we won the team event. So everyone was quite tired. And the first round is always a risk of coming up against someone quite strong and losing first round, even though I was seeded number one for that tournament. And what actually happened was I lost the first set and I was down 13, 20 in the second. And I ended up winning that second set 22, 20 and then winning the third quite comfortably. But just remembering that feeling is amazing. And it, it took me all the way to the finals where I did win the first set. And in the second set, I was down 17-20. And I remember just thinking to myself when I was down 17-20, I was just thinking, this is no problem. I was down 13-20. It's no problem. And I ended up winning that set 22-20 as well. So I think being able to draw on these kind of memories and these positivities is going to be really important in your future to make sure that you can keep motivated and basically use them in, at times where potentially your your mind can be turning to negative thoughts or ants, as we call them, Raj, in our episode. So let's skip to Coach Raj now. And I'm really interested just to see what the process was like for you as a selector or someone choosing the recipients for the First Ever Foundation. And what was it about William and Esther that stood out that you decided, hey, these two are really, really deserving of the first ever recipients of the first year of the first ever foundation. So Raj, take it away. Yeah, sure. So actually I wasn't involved in the selection process. We had a whole team, the board of directors who reviewed um, not only William and Esther's applications, but some of the other um, top male and female athletes that applied. So big credit goes to them for really going through all the personal statements, their grades, tournament results, and kind of the basis on how they chose the recipients was scholastic merit, their tournament results, and the character or what they took from their personal statement. So they used those kind of three main categories. And it was really tough because 
the three boys and the three girls that applied were like, they were all at the top of their class. So really any of the, the players could have won from um, this 2020 class. But just speaking um, from me personally, I've had the opportunity to coach both William and Esther, and I've also had the opportunity to coach against them. And I think what stood out to me when I found out that they were the winners was um, they both come from states where badminton is not big. And um, myself too, I came from Georgia where there's not as many opportunities to, to train or to play compared to California. And I think that's, that speaks volumes for the kind of dedication and commitment that they've put in because you're starting at a disadvantage. And um, when you can go to that first junior nationals, it could be very overwhelming and very intimidating. And for them to kind of overcome those first round exits and just go back to the drawing board and just put in hours and hours of preparation, that shows how much work they put in. And speaking about William specifically, um, he always has a really good attitude and intensity on the court. Like he's always hyped up. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Russell Westbrook on the Thunder, but he doesn't have like a 50% effort. It's always zero or a hundred. So right when it's from zero all, like he's already at a hundred percent. So I think that's something that always stood out to me from uh, William. And for Esther, she's just always had this kind of um, confidence, maturity, poise at such a young age. It's, it's very interesting to see how calm she is on the court and how fearless she is. And I think that's why she's been able to achieve like becoming the number one player in the country, whether it's a junior or an adult at 18, 17 or 18, because she doesn't fear anybody. Uh, Even starting so late, she gets on the court and she just has this poise about her that she's not afraid of a challenge. And I think when I heard that both of them were the winners, that was what first came to my mind. So really excited to kind of have them be the face of our foundation, you know, for the first year. Yeah, that's a really exciting description of both of them. I think I should probably give William and Esther an opportunity to respond to Raj as well. Do either of you have anything to say to Raj? I'm sure you probably already have spoken to after you'd received, uh, you've become the first ever foundation recipient. But is there anything that, yeah, you both want to say to that? Well, (laughs) I'm very very flattered i mean it's like very encouraging to hear someone that i look up to as like a coach that i have trained with in the past i personally don't necessarily see myself that way but i really appreciate it and i hope i can continue to become better and hopefully one day like become what i want to become (laughs) great how about you william uh, yeah, I would just like thank Coach Raj for all those kind words because sometimes you like I'm not that motivated during training after like training for multiple days in a row. But I like really try to live by like if I'm going 100% in my passion, I'm going 100%. And if I'm not, like why am I even spending time on this when I could spend 100% on something else I'm passionate about? So I was like, I was just really flattered when he said that because it actually sometimes reflects what I try to make myself believe and motivate myself with. Yeah, I think the I think we talked about this on some some of our other episodes. The court really exposes you as a person and it's really shone through that Raj was able to see what you were both like as characters outside of the court, as people um, outside of the court as well. And I know it's sort of awkward when you first hear or like when someone else says something about you and you have to respond to that. So thank you both for responding. I know it probably wasn't as easy as it might seem to be when you're thinking about it. So I I know Raj sort of touched upon, you know, how you both, uh, William and Esther, uh, grew up in places where badminton, I'm sure, is still considered a backyard sport like it is for most parts of Australia here. So I wanted to, I guess, get get a better understanding of what it was like to actually grow up in those areas. And let's start with William. Okay, so when I first started playing, there was this one coach who really inspired me to train, even though he was pretty hard on me when I was younger. But over time, he just like kind of mellowed out. (laughs) But when I first started learning from him, I could feel his passion. And all the students who trained with him could also feel it as well. We just all had that fire to be the best. But even then, it was very a very small group of people, like maybe at most 10. 
And because of it, it was always just like, we can always spar with each other so much before we already know each other's game. So we always have to try different things to make ourselves better. But everything outside of my club, it was like badminton just didn't really exist at all. Like I went to high school and there was a badminton club, but it was only for girls. And all of my friends were like, how is this even a thing? This shouldn't be allowed. <laughs> so a lot of my friends spent a lot of time trying to set up like a badminton club for not just girls, but for everyone. And we did the best we could, but there was just not enough people like supporting us in through the adults. Like a lot of my friends and people my age were like really into it, but all the adults were like, oh, this is just some random like sport that isn't really a sport. And so that was kind of uh, unmotivating for all of us. You could have just tried out for the women's team, William. <laughs> <laughs> And Esther, how about you? Was what, what was badminton like in Chicago? So was it recognized or did, when you said badminton, did they say, oh, is it ping pong or is it squash? That's usually the response we get. Is it that thing with the ball or is that, oh, and then you tell them what it is and they think, oh, it's that, it's that thing with the shuttlecock that flies really slowly. Um, what was your experience growing up being a badminton player? Uh, well, in my high school, we actually have a girls team as well, but I did participate in my first two years of high school. So the sport was like known as kind of just like a girls sport in Illinois, especially because we don't have a lot of male players, the West Coast. In fact, like my whole time training, probably like the past three, like my first three years training, I only really played with like one guy player who was kind of serious about training. So. It was kind of a thing in high school, but like you said, like most people just considered it a backyard sport. Mm. And then now as you're competing on a national level, being from a state that isn't really recognized for badminton within the US, it seems as though you are trying to challenge that status quo where you're making a name for yourself for the state that's not really that big in badminton. So what are the things you do that help you overcome kind of that, I don't know, I guess that feeling that you're, you might not be good enough or you don't, you're not worthy or you don't have the privilege to be good enough at the sport. Because I guess when, like Raj said, when you went to the first junior nationals, it could be very overwhelming because you see other states, other players where they've been training with all these high level coaches and lots of people playing, et cetera. And then you've come from a place where there's not that many players. Like how do you pick yourself up and say, and be bold against these players when it's really easy to shrink back and kind of shrink into the distance because you, you're a bit scared to expose yourself. Uh, for me, like the description you made, actually, I definitely see that with so many of my friends here that tried playing competitively for a while. In fact, when I started playing, there was maybe eight um, other girls who did travel around and play some of the tournaments around the U.S. with me. But I did definitely see, as you described, that they would kind of get scared if they heard like they're playing an opponent from California or like from a certain club. But for me, I guess like I didn't really think about it like that. I just like really enjoyed playing. Like I, I enjoyed it much more than I can say like my friends here did. So I just didn't think about being scared about playing someone specifically what like no matter where they're from I just wanted to go out and you know do my best and in the end like I just wanted to like improve for myself rather than trying to defeat someone from like California since they usually have like bigger reputations when it comes to badminton. Sure. So am I right in saying that instead of taking the challenge out to other people, you made it about yourself more. So you made it about improving yourself and beating yourself. So the old version of yourself, not really about having to beat the other person. Would you say that's accurate? Yeah, I think so. Okay. I think also something to add to that, like because they come from a region of the country where they don't have access to like as many top level coaches, what it allowed them to do too is like, they're gonna play a lot of games amongst themselves and really they do a lot of internal thinking and understanding the game individually versus someone always telling them, hey, this is what you're supposed to do. So a lot of times you can kind of see 
them really be a student of the game on the court, whereas maybe some of the athletes from California are waiting for the coach to give the next strategy. Whereas like they've been used to playing by themselves and adapting on the fly. So I think that's one of the skills and traits that they developed um, just coming from a region where badminton's not so big, you know? Yep. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's a great insight there, Raj. Now, so for William, now, did you feel similar, like a similar way when you went to your first junior national event? Uh, I would actually say I was quite the opposite (laughs) because after my first event and losing that one, I was like, I'm not going to lose this next one. And after just losing all three, I was like, I'm coming back next year and I'm taking everything back. And that actually worked out well for me because I took a break from the junior national in 2015 and I played the one in 2016 and I ended up getting to the semifinals that time. And that was like my big breakthrough afterwards. And like, which led to me getting better results over time. Yeah. It seems like you both are are very different and unique perspectives. um, Even though your pathways both converged to becoming recipients of the first ever foundation. So I want to, I guess, move on because now you're at a point you're finishing your high school, you're moving on to college, and this is where the first ever foundation comes into play, right? But I'm sure there have been moments where you were under pressure by family or friends to choose between, you know, taking a typical predictable life journey, going through academia, doing your education, doing your university degree, and then going into the working life, as opposed to chasing your badminton dreams. I mean, for both of you, have you experienced those kinds of conversations at all? And can you tell us a bit about it? Uh, yeah, I've definitely had conversations with my parents who have supported me throughout my bouncing career so far, but obviously looking towards college, especially during the application season, like last year, they kind of described like, cause I did express to them that I really wanted to pursue badminton as well as getting a degree in college. And there wasn't really like this scholarship, I didn't know about it yet. So there wasn't really like a very stable, I guess, way that I could pursue this at that time. Like we weren't really thinking about how it could happen, which is why the scholarship ended up kind of being like a miracle, kind of like fully encompassed everything that I was hoping for moving into college. I think even if the scholarship weren't to exist, I think my parents would support me in pursuing what I love to do, but they definitely did put a lot of like a set line of saying like, you have to first finish your studies before you can train. So that was always like the first priority. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I know how that feels. Don't worry. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And yeah, it does sound like the first ever foundation just came at the, you're in the right place, right time applied and received it. So that's excellent. William, how about you? Did you have those difficult conversations with parents at all or family or friends? So for me, when I was applying, I knew I wanted to keep pursuing badminton. Even even if I wasn't able to keep competing, I would at least try and keep playing. So all the colleges I applied to, except for like the top tier, like Ivy League colleges, all had like badminton gyms nearby. So I originally planned to be able to keep training. And I did have conversations with my parents talking about pursuing badminton because they knew Mm -hmm. how stressful it was. Because in their opinion, like education compared to competing in badminton is way easier and way more stable. So they really pushed me to have to kind of choose between badminton and education. But I kind of just kept pushing back and like maintained that I want to keep competing even if I was in college and over time they were like, okay, yeah, you can keep playing. Just make sure you're not sacrificing your education. Okay. Yep. Yep. So it definitely sounds like coming into the first ever foundation receiving this was a real blessing for you both. Now, how did you both hear about first ever foundation? Was it through the podcast? Was it through our podcast? (laughs) Please tell us it was through the podcast. (laughs) (laughs) So for me, I actually heard it through one of my coaches, uh, Coach May, who is a good friend of Raj. And she told me about it. And she was like, you need to apply for this because if you do, you can 
keep playing for sure. <laughs> so I heard about it and I just immediately started working on my application. Awesome. And Esther? I'm trying to remember, but I think I also heard from one of my coaches, maybe. Was it Ankit? I'm not sure. He might have mentioned it to my parents and then my parents might have told me, but I remember asking him about it. And yeah, he probably gave me more details about it. Okay. Yeah, and you've described it as a, as a bit of a miracle, but talk us through the the journey from actually first hearing about the application and to actually becoming recipients. Was, what was that sort of progress like for you both? For me, when I heard about it, when I read the description, I also wrote this in my application, but it seemed like what the foundation was offering was exactly what I was hoping for going into college. So I felt like the description fit me very, very perfectly. But also I did see like they only selected one male and one female. So I really had zero expectation of actually getting the scholarship when I applied for it. But obviously I really hoped for it and it really like turned into a dream come true. And Esther, while we're talking about it with you still, was there anything in particular you specially included in your application to try to stand out from the others at all? Um, I don't think I intentionally included anything to stand out, but I just kind of like shared my story, honestly. And I know like the people who reviewed the application, I was probably just hoping that they would like see me for who I am and how much I love the sport, which is, I think, one of the biggest parts that keeps motivating me and driving me to improve in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's definitely shone through in this podcast so far as well, Esther. How about you, William? Yeah, uh, once again, I would say I was probably the opposite. Like, I first... <laughs> I, I know I'm, I know I'm going to get this. I've got this. It's in the bag. Done, done deal. 100%. 100%. Right? No, I, I read the description and I was like, that's not me. I don't feel that invested into playing international. Like, I wanted to do it if I could. But going into college, I knew it was going to be very difficult, like not only on my parents, but on my own like mental health. So when I first started writing it, the one question that kept going through my head was, why should I get this? Because I knew there was other people who would be applying and they already like were dead set on going international to international competing. And I just really just didn't felt like I was the one person that they would choose because I think I was really passionate about badminton, but I never really voiced that I wanted to keep competing even through college, even though it was always something I was thinking about. So when I applied, I was just really not expecting anything. I was just, I'm just going to see if I can get it. If I get it, that's just a miracle. But if not, I'm not that sad, but I'll just like figure out a way to do it myself. I guess. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So after actually being successful in your application, has your opinion or has your thoughts about competing internationally and doing more things, has it opened or changed since receiving it? Yeah. Once I found out that I received the scholarship, I just like text all my coaches and I was like, I need to start competing as quick as possible. Help me train as much as I can. <laughs> and I think after I received it, I was like, this is something I would have regret if I had not gotten it. I was really just grateful that I was given the opportunity and I really want to take advantage, full advantage of it. Yeah, excellent. Now, when you're starting college now, let's move on to what you're actually doing. So for William, what will you be studying and where? Uh, I will be studying engineering at the University of Washington. Mm -hmm. Yep. And how long is that for? That will be for four years. I'll be picking my specific major in one year from now. But for now, I'm just undeclared engineering. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And Esther, what will you be studying and at which university? I'll be studying at the business school in Santa Clara University. Okay. And is that a straight business degree or does it, or do you choose your major half, halfway in between as well? Yeah, I'm also an undeclared business major right now, but I hope to be able to select a major where I can 
get my degree within three years, hopefully, because okay. I would like to start competing okay, earlier. Fantastic. All right. Excellent. So we've heard a lot from Esther and William on this podcast, but I want to go back to Raj, who is behind the first ever foundation. Now, Raj, how does it feel for you to be able to listen to these stories? Now, I know you've heard them before. Maybe you've heard some things today that you haven't heard from them previously. I'm not too sure. But when they talk about the difficulties that they've faced, one from being being from a region that wasn't really that strong in badminton, two, having that struggle to decide whether they had to choose university or study versus badminton, and three, how they've really expressed how grateful they are for receiving this the scholarship. How does that make you feel yourself personally? And how does that make the team at First of a Foundation feel and how does it motivate them and Basically, how does it align with the vision where you started off the foundation? Um, I would say for us and the team, I mean, just like Esther and William expressed their gratitude, we're also very thankful to have, for one, to have Yonix kind of sponsor us and um, mm-hmm. see our vision as a foundation. So super thankful for Yonix to being a part of that as well as just um, the badminton community coming together and supporting this cause. I mean, it's brand new during COVID and financially, you know, there's a lot of families that are struggling and there may be a lot of causes out there for badminton that have never kind of panned out. So to kind of have them put their trust and faith in us and donate and help us spread that message, it's been really, really inspiring to see that kind of support. And I'm sure you guys, see that for Volant Wear in the, in the Badminton podcast as well. So just really grateful for that. I think one thing that William and Esther brought up when you asked them the question of how did they maneuver those difficult conversations between choosing education and Badminton. And really that's, that is what the foundation we wanted to create a way for students to be athletes at the same time. And it's really challenging to make this big of a decision when you're 18 years of old and you may not really know what you want to do. So we really wanted to just give them a platform to kind of grow and find themselves. And, you know, by the time that they graduate college, whether they choose to pursue badminton at the professional route or not, at least we gave them the opportunity to continue to train and um, develop while they can earn their degree. So I would say, For me, I'm just very excited because this is kind of the start of many more things that uh, we want to do as a foundation. And because of our 2020 class being so strong, we definitely got straight to the uh, drawing board on how can we include more players in next year's scholarship because... You know, it's really hard to just give an award to one boy and one girl. So we're we're looking at other avenues to possibly next year have two guys and two girls receive a scholarship so that it gives more people an opportunity as well. Um, hopefully that can inspire the younger generations and show them like, hey, after high school, there is a route. Um, you don't have to fully dedicate to badminton or education. I think those two kind of go hand in hand to really you know, develop yourself into a successful adult. So it's a really exciting time and uh, just can't wait to see how this year moves forward. Yeah, we're also really excited for you and the rest of the First Ever Foundation team as well, Raj. I think one of the, yeah, one of the reasons why Jeff and I really love your initiative here is that it is that intersection between education and, and pursuing your dreams at the same time. So I'd encourage any listener out there that wants to learn more about the First Ever Foundation to get in touch with Raj, potentially get in touch with Esther and William as well, so they can get a bit more of an understanding of yeah, what their options are going into you know, a college degree, because it's not just going into college and going into the workforce afterwards. You can pursue something like badminton at the same time. So Raj, for those listeners that may not have watched our previous episode, um, where is the best place to learn about the First Ever Foundation? You guys can visit us at uh, www.firsteverfoundation.com. And there we'll have basically, you know, our mission statement, everything, um, how to apply for the scholarship. There's a donate button where you can help support us. Um, You can also follow us on us. Facebook and Instagram under the first ever foundation tag. And really, um, 
through this journey, we'll be able to kind of highlight and showcase Esther and William as, I mean, right now they can't compete, but at least we can get some training updates from them and really um, get to see how they want to use the funds and where they, they think it can really help develop and take their game to the next level. But we're on Facebook, Instagram, and our website if you guys want to support us or just get in touch with us. So. Fantastic. So that's all there for you. And it will be in the podcast description as well. So make sure you do check them out. Now for William and Esther, if there's any of your fans out there, especially you, Esther, but William, I'm sure you've got some as well. If they do want to follow your progress and see how you're doing, see what you're up to in both your studies and in your life, is there any way that they can keep up with your progress at all? Yeah, uh, I've been thinking of starting to document my progress on my Instagram, which is at william.who. So you can check that out if you want. Excellent. Yep. And Esther? Yes, you can follow my Instagram, which is at estershe07. I think I also, as well, start documenting my progress with competitions and such. Awesome. Fantastic. So we'll leave the descriptions for both of those in our description for this podcast as well. Now, a final parting question for you both, William and Esther, for future potential candidates of the First Ever Foundation, if you were to give the uh, you know someone applying for the First Ever Foundation in, in the future, let's say three tips, what would they be? Um, I would say... Firstly, if you have a dream, you should pursue it, no matter how hard it might seem or how many obstacles it might seem like there are, because obviously badminton is not like the most like a pathway to success, especially in America. Secondly, I would say don't be afraid of failure. If anything, I think that failure leads to learning. And as we always say, losing is learning. And one of the biggest lessons Bampton has taught me is sometimes it's actually better to lose because there's a a lesson to learn. And it will also benefit you in the long run, not only as an athlete, but in life and as a person. And lastly, I would say if you don't play Bampton, well, I mean, if you're like talking to people that might apply, spread the word and, you know, get your friends to play because I think this sport deserves so much more recognition and it's definitely not as popular as it should be in some countries such as the U S. So yeah, I think that's it. Excellent. Three awesome pieces of advice. And William, can you top that off with another three? I would say one thing that for, that was really beautiful for me is to just be genuine with not only yourself, but with the people in your life. Because for me, I my parents were always pushing me into education and I would always go along with it. And over time, I was like, I want to go into education and pursue higher learning, but I don't want to give up badminton. And I'm not willing to give it up so quickly. And I think Because of that and being like honest with myself and my parents, it really helped me to open up this new pathway for me. And my parents started supporting me more because they saw that I had a drive to try and be the top player. Something else I would say is to just have fun because I think a lot of times people can get really into something, but then it becomes such a consistent rhythm that they forget why they start playing in the first place. And Mm -hmm. I think for me, like after my worst burnout, I just had fun playing badminton. I just tried to have fun on the court rather than just playing to keep training and maintaining my physical, but rather, and just focusing on, I guess it's hard to say to focus on having fun, but to just like leave out all the stress off the court and just be yourself on court and have fun. So we'll leave it at two, William, or we're going to any more? Finish it yeah. up for one more. <laughs> Got one more. Uh, I would say to be okay with when things don't go right. I guess this is similar to learning to accept failures, but I think that even if everything goes your way, you're not going to be as strong mentally as someone who faced a lot of failures and made it to the same spot. Because for me, growing up, it was just I faced a lot of challenges in pursuing badminton and 
I think because I was able to overcome those, it just helped me develop more about who I was as a person and how much I actually had a passion for managing. Excellent. Excellent. Very mature and yeah, very deep responses by both of you. So first of all, we just want to say from Henry and I, thanks to both of you and Raj for being on another episode of the Badminton Podcast. Thanks so much for having us. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you for this opportunity. Great. And for everyone listening, thanks so much for tuning in. Make sure you do share this podcast episode with everyone that you know, because there's lots of wisdom here. Yes, they may only be 18 years old, but with their youth comes a great breadth of knowledge. So make sure you do have a good listen. Make sure you do share it. And of course, if you are a badminton player, especially in the US, and you are looking to make that transition into college life then the first ever foundation is there to support you so there's lots of information you can get from the website so make sure you do check that out and i'm sure raj and the team will answer any and all of the questions that you may have so make sure you keep playing even though times are a bit tough at the moment you keep sharing your love of the sport with everyone that you know not just badminton players because as esther said It really is a sport that deserves a lot more recognition amongst all communities, not just the badminton community. And the bigger we can grow our badminton family, the better off the sport is going to be, not just in the US, not just in Australia, but around the world as well. And recognize that if you do come from a place where badminton is not so popular, that you, just like these two young adults, can still become very successful badminton players And you can learn a deeper understanding of the sport just like these two have because they've had to play essentially the same sort of community over and over again where they've had to become a lot more creative on court and actually think about the sport and understand the sport better as Raj said earlier in the podcast. So if you've enjoyed this episode, please just send it out to all your friends, your family, people who love badminton, people who don't love badminton, uh, basically everyone in the world that you know, just, just send it to them because it's a great episode. I'm excited by the three of you that have come onto the episode and, and just given us so much knowledge and so much insight into US, the First Ever Foundation and the both of you as well. Um, so thank you both for coming onto the podcast. Thank you, Raj, for being on the podcast. And for those that are listening, get out there, play hard if you can and have fun and share your love of the sport so that we can show the world how incredible badminton is. We'll see you on the next episode. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Bye. (laughs) This podcast was brought to you by Volantware, the most versatile badminton apparel you'll ever own.